It all began with the persistence of vision, a phenomenon where the eye remembers what it has just seen after the object has disappeared. In film and video, this phenomenon is widely believed to account for our ability to perceive a sequence of frames as one moving picture. In 1500, Leonardo da Vinci gave a full description of the camera obscura, an optical device that projects an image of its surroundings on a screen. Leonardo da Vinci was far before his time. In 1515, he created a drawing of a type of image projector called the Magic Lantern, which was later developed in the 17th century. In 1802, Joseph Plateau introduced the Phenakistoscope, where pictures on one disc viewed through slots on another appeared to move when the two were spun and viewed together. The zoetrope was introduced by William George Horner in 1834. The zoetrope used the same principles as the phenakistoscope, but instead of discs, the pictures and slots were combined on a rotating drum. In 1877, Emile Reynald introduced the latest findings of optical reproduction of movement, the proxenoscope. Similar to the zoetrope, the illusion of movement produced by the proxenoscope was viewed on mirrors on the center of the drum rather than through the slots on the outside. In 1872, Leland Stanford, the governor of California, insisted that a horse in full stride takes all four feet off the ground. Stanford hired Edward Muybridge, a San Francisco photographer, to prove his point and settle a $25,000 bet. After many unsuccessful experiments, Muybridge mounted a line of cameras along the race track and tripped the shutters where electromagnets as a horse and rider galloped down the race track and over a hurdle. The pictures prove that the horse does indeed take all four hoofs off the ground while galloping. Muybridge developed a projector to present his findings. He adapted Horner's zoetrope to produce his zoopraxinoscope. In East Orange, New Jersey, Thomas Edison was working on perfecting one of his inventions called the phonograph. In 1870, Edison assigned William Dixon the project of developing a machine that could visually accompany his phonograph. For over two years, not much resulted. They finally designed a machine called the Mutoscope that they thought might work. But what were the pictures to be on? In 1888, George Eastman devised a flexible film-based cover with photographic emulsion. This is exactly what Edison and Dixon were looking for. The result? The Connectoscope. The Connectoscope is a continuous loop of film that passed over a series of rollers and in front of a lens, but it had a flaw. It allowed only one person at a time to watch the moving image being put on display. Thomas Armott found that what the camera did to hold the film stationary while the images were being photographed could be repeated in a projection mechanism itself. The Lumiere family was the biggest manufacturer of the photographic plates in Europe. Louis and Auguste designed a cinemagraph, a camera which served as both a recording device and a projecting device. The cinemagraph used flexible film cut into 35mm wide strips and used the intermittent mechanism modeled on the sewing machine. The camera shot film at 16 frames per second, rather than the 46 that Edison used. This became the standard film rate for nearly 25 years. The creation of cinematography served as a basis and key outlet for many different styles and forms of animation to grow. The earliest form of animation that arose were captured on film by either taking a series of snapshots of hand-drawn images or of objects that were moved in small increments. Without the use of the camera, neither of these animation styles would have been possible. The earliest animated film was created by J. Stuart Blackton. The first film that was recorded on standard picture film and included animated sequences was The Enchanted Drawing. The film was a combination of silent film and stop-motion animation that showed a man drawing a cartoon face on an easel. He then takes objects off of the canvas and they go back into the image. Around the same time, an animator by the name of Emile Cole was working on the newest technique that was considered by film historians to be the first animated cartoon called Phantasmagoria. The film was created by drawing each frame on paper and then shooting each frame on negative film, which gave the picture a blackboard look. It was made up of 700 drawings, each of which was exposed twice, leading to a running time of almost two minutes. 
It borrowed from J. Stuart Blackton the chalk line effect, filming black lines on white paper, then reversing the negative to make it look like a white chalk on a black chalkboard. The first instance first stop motion techniques can be credited to Albert E. Smith and J. Stuart Blackton for Vitagraph's The Humpty Dumpty Circus from 1897, in which a toy circus of acrobats and animals come to life. Though Blackton and Cole's animations were very simplistic, they served as an inspiration for many up-and-coming animators, including a gentleman by the name of Windsor McKay. McKay was best known for his animated short Little Nemo and the animated film Gertie the Dinosaur. For Little Nemo, McKay made the 4,000 rice paper drawings for the animated portion of the film. The animated portion took up almost four minutes of the film's total length. Photography was done at the Vitagraph Studios under the supervision of animator pioneer James Stewart Blackton. During the live action portion of the film, McKay bet his colleagues he could make his drawings move. He won the bet by animating his Little Nemo characters, who shapeshifted and transformed. Much of the potential of hand-drawn animation was stumped because of how difficult it was to make anything longer than animated shorts. Longer animated films were made possible through the creation of celluloid sheets, which revolutionized the way animation was created. This involved animating moving objects on transparent, which were then placed over a stationary background image, and then photographed to generate the sequence of all images. It saved animators a tremendous amount of time and sped up the animation process. Feature-length films could now be created because both production costs and production time were dramatically cut in half. At this point, the larger scale animation studios were becoming the industrial norm, and artists such as McKay faded from the public eye. A need for speeding up the tedious process of animation also led to the development of a specialized camera created solely for the purpose of capturing and animated images for cartoon animation called the rotoscope. Rotoscoping is an animation technique in which animators trace over footage, frame by frame, for use in live action and animated films. Originally, recording live action film images were projected onto a frosted glass panel and redrawn by an animator. This projection equipment revolutionized hand-drawn animation and paved the way for the golden era of traditional animation. Feature-length films were now a foreseeable project. In 1923, a studio called Lapograms went bankrupt and its owner, Walt Disney, opened a new studio in Los Angeles. Disney's first notable breakthrough was 1928's Steamboat Willie, which was the first cartoon to include a fully post-produced soundtrack featuring voice and sound effects printed on the film itself. Meanwhile, stop-motion animation was also gaining fame among the public. At the turn of the century, a well-known animator known as Willis O'Brien was pioneering how stop-motion animation was used in films. His work on The Lost World is well known, but he is most admired for his work on King Kong, as it became a high point in his work that made stop motion animation possible because it broke ground by using animation as a special effects technique for films. The camera's involvement in the stop motion animation process was crucial to bring the characters to life. Every frame was a snapshot that captured the small increments of movement of each object and character. It was an extremely tedious process, and one small mistake in setup could destroy months of animation, as they would have to begin all over. O'Brien's prodigy and eventual successor in Hollywood was Ray Harihasun. After learning under O'Brien on the film Mighty Joe Young, Hirohasun would go on to create the effects for a string of successful and memorable films over the next three decades. These included It Came From Beneath the Sea, Jason and the Argonauts, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, and The Clash of the Titans. 
Traditional animation was in its golden age with the beginning of Disney's first feature-length animated film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Snow White was the first to become successful and well-known within the English-speaking world, and the first to use Technicolor cell animation. Also, with the creation of the multiplane camera, animation was made simpler and saved valuable time. The multiplane camera is a special motion picture camera used in the traditional animation process that moves a number of pieces of artwork past the camera at various speeds and at various distances from one another. This creates a three-dimensional effect. Various parts of the artwork layers are left transparent to allow other layers to be seen behind them. The movements are calculated and photographed frame by frame, with the result being an illusion of depth by having several layers of artwork moving at different speeds. The furthest away from the camera, the slowest the speed. An interesting variation is to have the background and foreground moving in opposite directions. This creates an effect of rotation. An early example is the scene in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves where the evil queen drinks her potion and the surroundings appear to spin around her. Following Snow White's release, Disney began to focus much of its productive forces on feature-length films. All the films used the basis of both traditional hand-drawn and stop-motion animation for a number of years, but eventually they met their limitations. The biggest was time consumption between the two styles. Much of the traditional animation was very tedious work and required many cells to create these beautiful animated clips. Stop motion had similar problems, although it faced another limitation. Because the animated object was perfectly sharp in every frame, since each frame of the animation was actually shot where the object was perfectly still, it was restricted to a certain speed. Real moving objects in similar scenes of the same movie will have motion blur because they moved while the shutter of the camera was open. Traditional animation also faced similar limitations. With the rise of computer technology, the gradual decline of the use of the cell in traditional animation began to take place, replaced with scanners as the computers moved into the animation studio and the outlining drawings were usually scanned into the computers and filled with digital paint instead of being transferred to cells and then colored by hand. The drawings are composited in a computer program on many transfer layers, much in the same way as they are with cells, and made into a sequence of images which may then be transferred onto film or converted into a digital video format. The Little Mermaid was the last Disney feature film to use the traditional hand-painted cell method of animation. Disney's next film, The Rescuers Down Under, used a digital method of coloring and combining scanned drawings developed from Disney by Pixar's called CAPS, Computer Animation Production System, which would eliminate the need for cells, the multiplanar camera, and many of the optical effects used for the last time in The Little Mermaid. Computer animation was rapidly replaced in the tedious techniques used for both traditional and stop-motion animation. The need for films to be more realistic and less time-consuming made digital technology more appealing to animators to shift towards computer animation. Computer animation resulted from a shift from using film cameras to using digital cameras and computers to create animation. Computer animation or CGI animation is the process used for generating animated images by using computer graphics. Computer animation is essentially a digital successor to the stop motion techniques used in traditional animation with 3D models and frame by frame animations of 2D illustrations. Computer-generated animations are more controllable than other more physically-based processes, 
such as constructing miniatures for effect shots or hiring extras for crowd scenes, and because it allows the creation of images that would not be feasible using any other technology. The first feature-length computer-animated film was the 1995 movie Toy Story by Pixar. It followed an adventure centered around toys and their owners. The groundbreaking film was the first of many fully computer-animated films. Much of the animation at the beginning was very simple and somewhat crude, because only those skilled in using and understanding the complex software could create animation. As computer technology grew easier for the common individual to manipulate, there was more room for artistic ability to thrive. Different styles began to emerge, and animation companies like Pixar and DreamWorks grew substantially in the film industries. With the popularity that computer animation was receiving, traditional and stop-motion animation had taken a backseat to the public's eye. Compared to stop-motion and traditional animation, the process was less tedious and much more manageable for feature-length films. Stop-motion still preserved the use of the camera in its animation process, as it was required to keep the style that many still craved. There have been an increasing number of traditional stop-motion feature films in the past few years, despite advances with computer animation. The Nightmare Before Christmas, James and the Giant Peach, and Coraline, as well as The Corpse Pride and Frankenweenie, were among some of the most widely released stop-motion features. Though the stop-motion films never made grossing income compared to computer animation, it is still the unique style and animation that always brings both audience and animators interest in preserving the style. Stop-motion animation will continue to require a camera, be it film or digital, in order to preserve the style, so as long as someone is willing to continue to preserve the style, the camera will remain a part of stop-motion animation. The camera has made a comeback in its involvement in the animation industry through the creation of motion capture animation. Motion capture is the process of recording the movement of objects or people. In filmmaking and video game development, it refers to the recording actions of human actors and using that information to animate digital character models in 2D or 3D computer animation. In motion capture sessions, movements of one or more actors are sampled many times per second. Whereas early techniques used images from multiple cameras to calculate 3D positions, often the purpose of motion capture is to record only the movements of the actor, not his or her visual appearance. This animation data is mapped to a 3D model so that the model performs the same actions as the actor. This process may be contrasted to the older techniques of rotoscope, such as the Lord of the Rings or American Pop animated films, where the motion of the actors was filmed, then the film used as a guide for the frame-by-frame -frame motion of a hand-drawn animated character. Video games often use motion capture to animate athletes, martial artists, and other in-game characters. Motion capture has begun to be used extensively to produce films which attempt to simulate or approximate the look of live-action cinema, with nearly photorealistic digital character models. The Polar Express used motion capture to allow Tom Hanks to perform as several distinct digital characters. James Cameron's James Avatar used this technique to create the Navi that inhabited Pandora. Motion capture animation has somewhat brought back the role of the camera and its involvement in animation. Although it is an infrared camera that tracks movement rather than capturing it in a series of photographic snapshots, it still follows the basic concept of recording and animating movement. But what has become of industries that don't use traditional animation anymore, that have completely removed the use of the camera in their animation process? In the Disney 
I mean, one of my first impressions about being here was that um, there was drawing everywhere. There's a deep legacy of it being in the final product, right up there on the screen, that goes back, you know, to the very beginning. And, you know, there's something about that hand of the artist that I really admired so much. It was so expressive and it can tell such great emotion and with such simplicity. And when I saw all the pre-production drawings for, for any show, but particularly for Paper Man, there were such phenomenal drawings being done of all the characters and it seemed like why do we have to leave these drawings behind? Isn't there a way that we can get these drawings to move on top of the CG? Can't we get the CG to carry those drawings along with them? I mean, I feel that we're definitely in a golden age right now of CG where there's this explosion of content. It's beautiful color and, and appeal and characters are so expressive and alive and, and um, but as good as that is, I, there's part of me that believes that that kind of stylized photorealism, it isn't, it can't be the only way that computer animation can look. There's got to be other ways that, that animation can look. And I, I feel like bringing the drawing back to it has a great deal of potential. With the development of the drawing tablet, is there hope of traditional two-dimensional animation making a comeback in animation industries? The future for animation is one that will continue to adapt and change to fit what the audience desires.